Hello, welcome to the Eurogen webinar programme. I'm Michelle Batty and I'm the manager of the European Reference Network known as Eurogen, which deals with rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions. And Eurogen is one of 24 European reference networks covering all different medical fields, which were created and are kindly funded by the European Commission since 2017. And the aim of the reference networks is to collaborate really to improve care for patients with rare diseases and complex conditions. So where the expertise is rare. And we collaborate on a number of activities. Um, we have virtual consultations where the networks uh, experts can come together in a European level type MDT meeting and provide advice on specific patients with a rare disease or complex condition. Um, we also collaborate on education and training activities such as this webinar programme and on clinical guideline development together. And finally, most ERNs are developing patient registries. So we hope that they'll be really important in the future to gather the evidence uh, needed for the guidelines and also for future research. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce uh, our presenters this evening. And today's webinar is about bladder augmentation, associated surgeries and complications. And it's presented by Dr. Christina Torobaldi and Dr. Danielle Cabazali. And they're both from the Department of Urology, Hospital Universitario, uh, 12th of October in Madrid. And uh, we often uh, collaborate with the scientific societies in our area. And I'm delighted that this webinar is also supported by the European Society for Pediatric Urology. Um, I hope you enjoy this evening's webinar and thank you very much for attending. Good night. Good afternoon. I'm Cristina Tordave, pediatric surgeon and pediatric urologist in Hospital 12 de Octubre de Madrid. And I'm going to talk about bladder augmentation and its complications. I have no disclosures. Our urinary tract dysfunction has a lot of causes. The main one are congenital, as neurogenic bladder secondary to spinal dysfunctions. Anatomical, because of extrophia epistadias complex, posterior retral valves or other conditions. Or acquired, because of tumors or other causes. The treatment, at first, is a non-surgical treatment in order to improve the function of the bladder, which used to have low capacity, low compliance, overactivity or incontinence. The treatment starts with anticholinergics, clean intermittent catheterines, and Botox injections. But when it fails or have less or no response, we have the bladder augmentation. So we create a low pressure reservoir with a high capacity for urine, ensuring a good emptying and trying to avoid the vesicoretral reflux in order to preserve the upper urinary tract and the renal function. So bladder augmentation can be done traditionally with a small intestine colon or stomach. But in the last 20 years, most surgeons use ileum and we use cystoplasty as a synonym of bladder augmentation. So we can find two types of complications. One because of the surgical technique, another depends of the tissue we use for the augmentation. There are also associated surgeries that brings its own complications. We review our patients with cystoplasty and analyze our results in order to have a guide to compare them with their results on international papers. We will try to acquire new knowledge about some complications and maybe, if we are lucky, how to solve them and how to prevent them. And I think it is very important to think carefully about the need of some very invasive treatments before offer them to our patients. We did a retrospective review of the patients with cystoplasty the last 25 years in the Hospital 12 de Octubre. We found 35 patients, 25 males and 10 females, with age between 6 and 20 years old and a mean age of 11.6.
These are the main diagnoses for the bladder augmentation. Most of them are bladder extrophies or neurogenic causes. This article is from Australia and they reviewed 25 years and find that the number of histoplasties are going down because of new non-surgical treatments. We perform 17 sigmoid histoplasties, 14 before 2002, and 18 iliophistoplasties, 15 after 2002. Our patients receive in the same surgery a diversion conduit in 17 cases, 15 half a mitrofanov, and to a mounting procedure because appendix was not available. The other associated surgeries were eight bladder neck disconnections, 10 bladder neck reconstructions, one sphincter, and 11 ureteral reimplantations with a coin or polytano style. And these are our results with no filters. We have 89 complications in 32 patients of the 35 analyzed. In three of them, the complications was managed with non-surgical treatment, but 29 patients need at least another surgery. But some of them need more than one, with a total of 71 procedures. This is a mean of 2.02 procedures per patient with enterocystoplasty, and the 82% of the patient who underwent one. Of course, all the complications are not the same, and we have classified them as Clavian Dindo. I'm just going to talk about those who are very common or those which need reintervention. Thank God we don't have any deaths of patients. So these are all the complications we found, and these are the ones that needed special attention or handling on our part. So let's start from the easy one, or not that easy, we found 12 urinary tract infections, and 10 of them need hospital admission. As we see, some of the papers classified the complications in metabolic or non-metabolic, but some of them don't consider UTI as a complication. So we miss a very important high rate of complications that seem to be easy, but they not always are. We had to perform one nephrostomy to a patient, another one needed an nephrectomy for a non-functional kidney after a pyelonephritis. This represents a rate of the 34% of the admissions in these patients. This other paper shows a 22 of UTI with a 14% of febrile UTI. In some countries, like Spain, there are different hospitals for their complexity so some of the UTI can be missing on those hospital or outpatient clinics. This paper shows that asymptomatic bacteriuria is between 50 to 100%. An infection rate, although much lower, can be as high as 43%. This one shows a rate of a 51% of infections and a 17 of the data are missing. So I found this article that say there is a chronic bacteriuria as high as 85%, but they have a significant reduce of the incidence of bacteriuria and UTI with bladder saline irrigations of at least 240 millimeters combined with CIC, with a P of 0 0.0001. In the case of litiasis, we found 17 stone surgeries on 10 patients. Although the higher rate in sigma is not significant in our center, is one of the reasons why sigma histoplasties were discontinued. The treatment for our stones was 12 cystolitectomies, 3 cystolitolapaxis, and 2 cystolitotomies. We have to be very careful because some medications and some surgeries lead us to more complications such as the psychocutaneous fistula that happen in 25% of cystolitectomy. In this article, they find 23% of stone formation, 20 of the 59 patients need 34 surgeries because of the stones, which is a very similar rate to us. 
This one shows similar incidence of urolithiasis on those patients who performed washouts and those who were not, but is not statistically significant. On the other hand, this one proves that, that patients with bladder augmentation and continent stoma have a 50% incidence for bladder stones after five years of the surgery. And they reduce their incidence from 47 to less than 5% by the high volume irrigations of more than 240 milliliters with water or saline. We have done 17 stomas, 15 Mitrofanov and two Montis, and we found two prolapses that needed three flap reduce, one liquid that was managed with bulking agent injection and nine stenosis, two needed cystoscopy and catheter, but three had to go to the theater to a partial resection or a redo of the channel. So that is two surgeries, a rate of 70 of all tunnels. This paper shows a rate of 61% of complications in this type of conduit. I love this article. It divides the complications on Montes up to 50% of complications and Mitrofanov up to 61%, and also describes 22 stoma revisions performed in 16 patients with appendicobesicostomy with a higher rate of complications in Montes than in Mitrofanov. But it also compares the complications rate with the obesity or BMI of the patients, proving that with a BMI lower than 30, the rate is 50%. But if the BMI is higher than 38, the complication rate is 100%. For me, this sign is very important because one of our complicated patients was obese and gave us a lot of headaches. Now, I will think about it twice before doing imitrofanov in the fat patients. In our survey, we have five bowel obstructions in three patients with a range of 10 days to 10 years from surgery. One has an stenosis, three have bowel adhesions, and one has a bulbulus around the mitrofano. It was 10 years after the procedure, and there is no difference between the tissue we use. Bowel obstructions seem to happen in approximately 3% of cases, and it is frequent to find an internal hernia or a bulbulus around the vascular pedicle of the augmentation or the continent stoma. We have two bladder perforations, one seven days after surgery with a day sense of the anastomosis, and one 10 months later with conservative man management with laparoscopy, aspiration, and drainage. No shooter was needed. The overall rate of perforation seems to be around 5%, with higher rate in those with ileum augmentations and those with regular CIC, more than four hours, and no incremental ones. We performed 10 bladder neck reconstructions with young dislet better technique, eight bladder neck disconnections, and one sphincter. We have seven complications on bladder neck reconstruction group, two needed a reduced surgery, one had a bladder neck disconnection, and one had a spontaneous closure. On the bladder neck disconnection group, one needed a redo, and one needed two new surgeries, one with a flap of gracilis muscle to close that fistula. There are more complications on the reconstructions than on the closures. So as you can see, a lot of articles don't analyze the associated surgeries, so we miss a lot of associated complications that we think are very important because blood augmentation usually goes with at least two or three different procedures. Other complications that can seem less important are listed here. We have one urethral obstruction in our 11 patients with brain implantation that is a 9% of structures, and paper shows up to 55% of BUR. We just have one patient with important metabolic disorder that develop an osteoporosis. We have three patients with orchidopedimitis, 
that are treated with antibiotics. One of our patients developed a fourniel gangrene. This is important because it's a life-threatening event, but we don't know if gangrene is associated with a surgery that was 15 years earlier or if it is an isolated event. And finally, lucky us, we don't find any tumor until now. This article shows a high rate of mortality in patients with bladder augmentation who developed adenocarcinoma or transitional cell carcinoma. But this paper detected only three patients with transitional carcinoma, 260 patients, and other colleagues find only four binary tumors on 250 patients. So that is why they changed the protocol and they only perform a cystoscopy in symptomatic patients, such with hematuria or suspicious lessons on imaging studies. So here are some take home messages. There is a high number of complications due to this very complex surgical technique, but also because of the number of associated surgeries. We must inform our patients about the high rate of complications and the possibility of needing multiple reinterventions, despite we know the surgery will improve his quality of life. There are complications with high incidence, just with saline washouts, so we have to insist a lot on our patients, particularly those in their teens. Think about DMA before indications of diversions. It is hard to tell that maybe it would be better to decrease the weight before surgery, change their habits, or change our procedure. We must review our protocols of cystoscopy to evaluate tumors to be less costly and more efficient. And that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. I, I would like to say that um, as can you see, the bladder augmentation is often associated with other surgeries and that the complications do not add up but multiply. So, so we think it's very important to look at them as a whole thing and not only as an augmentation because it's rarely isolated surgery. So we think about everything. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so I, I forward you on a comment from uh, Remy Gander, actually, who commented. Um, he was one of our former um, presenters on here. So um, can you see? I, yeah. I think there's a conclusion. Oh, yes. Um, can you see it under? You should have a questions field now where you should be able to see things. I can reset. Yeah, I think it's not just the question, it's like. Um... A comment, comment yeah. that in fact complication after yeah, bladder augmentation can be high, and we must be aware of it, of course. Um, not all the article shows all the complications in these children. Um, and if you choose the complication you want to count uh, in the end, your complication rate is lower, and you create a, a false reality, which those of us who operate on these patients are trying to achieve, and it's very frustrating because. The other people say that the complication rate is lower than you. So, I, I, Daniel and, and I want to to show our our results and want to to review our patients and say all the complications. Um, thank you for your presentation. What do you think about social reintegration of these patients and quality of life? Well, we are uh, reviewing the quality of life for these patients. Um, now we are uh, making some tests of them, um, but they improve very much their quality of life. And if you ask them if they will make the surgery again, uh, almost 90% say that yes, that they, they will have the surgery again. And despite of the complications, they are happy with that. Yeah, maybe maybe the next uh, webinar we can show our results about quality of life <laughs> because we are we are working on it. No, Christina. 
that would mm -hmm. be good to have a follow up if you wanted to absolutely to to follow this up i think that's a very good idea with some of these webinars um to to follow them up with um findings that you you've made since since this one so that'd be great please let us know when you want to do that so um okay has anybody got any other questions please do send them through now if so um for a few seconds um And so we'll send out to all um for everybody who's obviously attended or to all people who registered as well have been registered we'll send out the direct links to recordings tomorrow they'll be available on go to webinar or on the youtube channel um so please do you look at the if you watch the youtube channel please subscribe as well and you'll get notified whenever we upload the uh, new videos um we, so we have got quite a lot of presentations coming up in the next uh six months or so um mm -hmm. Okay, I, so um, I said I'll forget anything else. Um, people send them through, I will forward them on. Um, if you want to send them on later, that's absolutely fine. I'll say people watching this back, please do feel free to uh, message. Um, okay, with that, I'll say thank you to everybody for attending, and thank you most of all for uh, to Christina and to Daniel for uh, presenting this webinar. Um, again, apologies for the technical difficulties. <laughs> but, uh, um yeah um thank you very much indeed and yeah absolutely it would be great if you could do a follow-up at some point that would be uh, marvelous so thank you everyone um please all take care and have a good evening and we'll see you all again soon thank you thank you so much for your attendance and for the invitation thank you thank you take care everyone bye bye